the dog in. So we brought the dog in the store. I did it at the festival. I tell people about it. I wear mugs. Museum in Maine, where the bottle is located. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, I want to buy a book. I'll bring seats. Go to the Matthew Museum in Maine. Uh, we're not taking a dime off the books. All right, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much um, for joining us on this beautiful Saturday morning. Um, I know that you have lots of choices of ways to spend your day, so we really appreciate it that you have come spend it at the Milliard Museum. Um, and if you do not know, has anyone ever not been to the museum? Is this your first time? All right, well, welcome. Um, and since John Clayton is not here, I will say what he always says, well, you can never say that again. Because now <laughs> you have been here and you are um, sanctioned to be our ambassador and you need to come tell everybody about this, hopefully not so hidden gem anymore. Um, and so the Milliard Museum is run by the Manchester Historic Association. Um, we do not get any state, city, or government funding, so we are solely run by wonderful people like you who become members, which we do have membership um, applications up at the front desk. If you pay to get here today um, and you become a member, you will never have to do that again um, until next year when I have you renew. Um, but we are here to present Meryl Lewis's talk on Moxie. Um, all of you orange shirts out in the crowd know exactly what he's going to say. Um, and this should be pretty entertaining. So if you need anything, um, housekeeping, bathrooms are next to the elevator. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to give it to Meryl. Thank you. And uh, there is free Moxie. <laughs> Diet and regular for anybody that chooses to partake. And I got kind of thirsty myself. <laughs> I think I drink the diet, but it hasn't really done me that much good. <laughs> uh, my co-author, Dennis, Dennis Sassaville, is in the back. Want to raise your hand, Dennis? I don't know who you are. <laughs> and the young lady selling hats and t-shirts and so forth is my wife, Diana. <laughs> Thank you, Diana. My sisters in the audience who always is at everything that anybody has that has the name Lewis on it. <laughs> she shows up. And uh, anyhow, without further ado, we're going to tell you everything you never wanted to know about Moxie. <laughs> and this day's presentation is Moxie in the Milliard for obvious reasons. So here we are. And this is not the first time we've been at the Milliard. Uh, yeah. Approximately 10 years ago, there was a talk on Pine Island uh, Park. And we had a replica of the Moxie Bottle House at that, uh, at that event. So here we are again. And it's not the first time that we've had an event about Moxie in the city. Here is a flyer dated 1906. So apparently they had Moxie Day at the Armory. Uh, so, you know, it's been around for a while. It's not a new kid on the block. Now I gave this presentation last week at the Aviation Museum of New Hampshire. Some of you actually may have, may have been there. Uh, so if you were, uh, you're gonna hear a lot of the same stuff. But if you haven't, it's all gonna be new. And part of the title of my presentation is How Moxie Helped Win World War II. And I'm going to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that that was the case. Wow. But first, a word from our sponsors. <laughs> we are the New England Moxie Congress. We are a fan club of Moxie. Uh, we call ourselves a Congress and we like to think that we perform a lot more adequately than that group in Washington. <laughs> But we've been around since 1991, and we have events, family events. Uh, this is a trip we took in uh, 2013 to the 
Moxie Bottling Company facility, which happens to be right close by in Londonderry, New Hampshire. So all, all, a lot of the Moxie produced in the United States is produced right here in our county. And we're also here to promote our new book, which was just uh, published by uh, Dennis and myself. And again, it covers mostly historical events and the 130 year old history of Moxie right up to the present day. And we certainly hope that you will uh, take the opportunity to buy one and have it, uh, have it endorsed by us. Now, the Congress, we attend the Moxie Festival in Lisbon Falls, Maine, which occurs on the second Saturday of July every year. And we've been doing that for a number of years. That festival has been around for 35 years. And a lot of people associate Moxie with Maine. And uh, Lisbon Falls likes to promote itself as the Moxie capital of the universe. <laughs> this year, the theme for the Moxie Festival is Moxie goes artsy. And don't ask me what that really means, but you have to be there. It's a great, it's a great. And we take Moxie vehicles to that parade. Here's a friend of ours uh, from uh, Manchester who had an orange Volkswagen, orange bug. Uh, name is Russ Pillado, if anybody knows him. And we hauled around a replica of the Moxie bottle house. We have motorcycles. We have the Moxie Horsemobile. Now, the Horsemobile is something we'll talk about a little later, but uh, every year we try to get at least one of those to our parade. And one of the other icons of Moxiedom is the Moxie Boy, and we have a guy that's, a 60-year-old guy that's trying to portray a 21-year-old Moxie Boy. <laughs> and then at the conclusion of Moxie Festival, we have our annual Quam Bank. And there's nothing, absolutely nothing, that goes better with the clam bake than nice ice cold moxie. So we do that. And we end up with a very happy crowd. And after the moxie festival, we repair to the Seashore Trolley Museum in Kenny Bunkport, where we have our annual business meeting. Now our annual business meeting consists of one, first, one item on the agenda, and that is where are we gonna have our next meeting? <laughs> it always comes out the same. We also support the Peas Greeters. For those of you who don't know, uh, there is a group of people in the Portsmouth area who greet every single flight in and out of Peas that's going over to the Middle East. And they've been doing that for years. And the Moxie Company has been generous enough so that every one of these troops has gotten some free Moxie. They've give, given over 10,000 cans of Moxie to these brave troops that's coming back and forth. So the theory is that these troops have a lot of Moxie, we might as well give them some in return. <laughs> One of the big questions of people that don't know about this drink is, what is Moxie? Where did it come from? They've heard the phrase, you got Moxie, they got Moxie, meaning spunk and verve and guts and all that kind of stuff, but they didn't, don't realize that that saying came from the drink itself. So we got a lot of moxie originated with the drink. And over the years, they had a lot of trouble trying to explain what it was. And the other question we get is, what does it taste like? Well, you know, the answer to that is, here, try one. <laughs> People are a little scared to do that. So root, our moxie is sort of in the root beer family. We have a little added kick. Uh, we have one of our members that calls it root beer on steroids. So I don't know how true that that is, but the main flavor ingredient is gentian. A gentian root is comes from the Pyrenees, and it is made. It is primarily used medicinally to to quell upset stomachs, uh, but it does have a bitter uh, aftertaste that people either really hate or really love. And that's the plant from which it is derived. Now, the history of Moxie, Dr. Augustine Thompson was born in Union, Maine, and he was a Civil War veteran. And he was a homeopathic physician, 
and he had a practice in Lowell, Massachusetts. And he first made Moxie in 1885 and patented at that time. Moxie is the country's oldest bottled soft drink. And uh, there were other soft drinks that were made somewhat before that, but they were all fountain drinks. He was the first one that found bottles strong enough to withstand the, the pressure of carbonation, and he got those bottles from Lineborough. There was a bottling works in Lineborough that made bottles strong enough to withstand that pressure, and that's where he got his first bottles, and that's when he started bottling it and distributing it nationally. So you'll see some of these old bottles that say Moxie Nerve Food, <coughs> Lowell, Massachusetts. They're good collector's items. So Moxie Nerve Food was what it was called back when it was invented. And in Lowell at that time, there were Ayers Drugs, there was Lydia Pinkham's, there was Father John's Medicines, and all these patent medicines of the era, uh, making very, very wild medicinal claims, some of which were substantiated by the fact that a lot of them contained alcohol and cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> Moxie never did. Moxie never, never had those, those ingredients. But nonetheless, they made some, some amazing medicinal claims. Here's a uh, label from one of the early 1800s Moxie bottles, and you see a whole list of uh, stuff and it says it's the only effective nerve food known that can recover brain and nervous exhaustion, loss of manhood, <laughs> imbecility, and helplessness. Well, it didn't do too good for me. <laughs> Paralysis, uh, softening of the brain, nah, that didn't work either. Locomotor ataxia, so if you get any of those things, have a moxie and we'll take care of it. The Moxie Nerve Foods Company, again, was started in Lowell, Massachusetts, and uh, we will be giving this talk, incidentally, in Lowell next, next week. And then they moved to uh, Boston, and they had a place on Haverhill Street in Boston, and they also had a branch in New York. They were, they were this is by horse and buggy now. They're uh, distributing this stuff all over New England, and they tried to do it all over the, uh, all over the country. And this picture is on the front of our book uh, showing the horse and buggies with the wagons that are delivering Moxie to uh, everybody. In the 20s, the Moxie company expanded. They bought an old brewery that had gone belly up because of prohibition, and they converted it to a, a building that, that made uh, soft drinks, and they called it Moxie Land. And it, they invited people to come and see it and how wonderful it was made. And, and this was a central bottling facility for uh, all of New England and actually all of the country. They didn't have franchising back when this, this was here. One of the things they did, incidentally, is on the top of their building, they wrote, put an arrow that showed pilots of the era how to get to Logan Airport. <laughs> that was on top of the Moxie Land building. That lasted until just after World War II, and for various reasons, which you're going to have to read about in the book, uh, they downsized. These are copies or, or samples of some of the bottles that existed from the earlier days when it said Moxie Nerve Food with all the wild medicinal claims, all the way up through when they changed their name to just Moxie. And then they diminished the medicinal claims and emphasized the logo back in the 20s, 30s, and so forth. Now, they had the unfortunate situation in 1948 because they weren't selling a lot of Moxie. They said, well, you know, all these other soft drinks are, are a lot sweeter. So we, we got to change the formula for Moxie, make it so it appeals to more people. So. They came out with a new Moxie, 1948. And they called it a sparkling beverage. And they said new, and they had a big advertising campaign. And that campaign went over like a concrete cloud. 
<laughs> Nobody who liked Marxy liked this stuff. So they reverted. They went from the sparkling beverage back to original Marxy. And then through the 50s and 60s, uh, they, when, when the deposit bottles went out of fashion, the, the, the visuals of, of the brand changed. Ted Williams became the spokesman for Marxy back in uh, the 50s. And uh, there's an incident with Mad Magazine, which you read about in the book, that caused Marxy to change their label to say, Mad About Marxy. <laughs> there was a connection. So all this happened toward the end of the 1960s. And by this time, uh, they would abandoned Moxyland they set up an office and laboratory just outside of Route 128, I-95, and uh, there they made the syrup and the concentrate, but by this time they franchised out. So they sell the syrup to somebody else who would then, uh, bottlers, who would then use that to make the local, uh, local bottles. Now Manchester, that, distributor was uh, Lafayette Beverages, also had offices in, in, uh, in Laconia. And it turns out that they were the Pepsi-Cola bottler. So Pepsi-Cola at one time had a strong interest in, in Moxie, and Kist and Lemmy and, and other brands that were bottled in here in Manchester. Did the bottle cap from one of the bottles from Lafayette Beverages, and here's a bottle that uh, at the time, bottles can be collected that have place names on them. And this one came from Manchester, from Lafayette. And they had little gimmicks that they would sell, little uh, uh, icons, like, uh, you know, I, I guess they also had wine because they, I don't know why else you'd have a corkscrew for sale. <laughs> Anyhow, Moxie, as an independent company, sort of gave up the ghost in the, uh, late 60s, and they sold their interest in to a outfit called Mornak Beverages. And Mornak was uh, an outfit that took a lot of oddball brands like New Grape and Kist and, and uh, Doc, or I guess Dr. Pip, or I, I don't know what all the other brands were, but they, they started to run these other brands from Atlanta. Now, obviously, a New England-based beverage didn't get a lot of attention, but Mornock ran them for 40 years. Uh, the bottlers were up here, and primarily the Coca-Cola Bottling Company of Northern New England was the major bottler of Moxie uh, for, for forever, and still is. And back in 1968, the Mornock Company said, you know, this stuff is too bitter. Maybe we ought to appeal to a sweeter taste. So let's come out with new Marxy. <laughs> 20 years later, Pong, they hadn't thought of this. So they had a big advertising campaign. They made a nice little dimpled bottle. It was kind of pretty. And guess what? It went over like a concrete cloud. <laughs> now, 10 years after that, this other outfit tried something called New Coke. <laughs> Guess what? That went over like a concrete cloud too. They've been trying it again. This year, Coke is trying the new Coke again. Uh, good thing I'm not in top management. Okay, since that time, of uh, they went back to, instead of original Moxie, they went back and called it Old Fashioned Moxie. And again, many bottlers had different bottle styles, and these are some of the bottles that were used for Marxy up through the uh, through the end of the 20th century. I said Coca-Cola Bottling Company in Northern New England, the major bottler, ended up buying the rights to Marxy uh, in uh, 2007, and they owned the brand. The bot local bottler owned the brand for 10 years, but just last year they sold to the the bottle or the uh, company in Atlanta. So today, the Coca-Cola company itself owns the rights to Moxie. That just happened. And people have asked me, well, what are they going to do with it? And my answer is, I don't know. 
I'm hoping that because now it's in with the Sprite and Fanta and some of the other national Coca-Cola brands that they will start paying more attention to distributing it nationally. But again, they didn't consult with me. So Coke is a Coke Sprite boy advertising to everybody to have a Coke, but now they can say, or a Moxie. <laughs> This is the product line as it exists today, uh, less a few. They don't make the diet in the two liter bottles anymore or the 20 ounce bottles, uh, but you can still get it in cans in most major supermarkets in this general area. And they do sell a two liter bottle and cans in most major supermarkets. Maine claims the rights to Moxie. Moxie is a main thing, okay? And they, in 2005, made Moxie the official state soft drink in the state of Maine. I was there during the signing. This is Governor Baldacci signing the bill that made Moxie the official state soft drink. And uh, that gentleman over there to the right, that official looking Grand Poole of the New England Moxie Congress was there to witness this whole thing. And after he did that, he took a sip of Moxie and he patted his head and he says, it's starting to work. <laughs> <laughs> but as much as Maine likes to claim Moxie, um, Manchester has rights to a lot of Moxie. 95% of the world's Moxie is produced right here in London area, New Hampshire, right off exit five, uh, I-93. Is the, it's a Coca-Cola bottling company and they make all of Moxie that <coughs> is produced in uh, New England. And the water that is used to make Moxie and Coke and everything else comes from Massapequa Lake. <laughs> so just think of it, as you're drinking a Moxie, just think of Massapequa Lake, because that's what you're drinking. <laughs> Marketing was a big uh, deal with Moxie over the years. There was two or three things which were very, very unique about Moxie marketing. This fellow by the name of Frank Archer was considered a genius of marketing, <coughs> and he did all kinds of uh, things to promote the brand so that back in 1920, Moxie actually outsold Coca-Cola nationally. You can believe that, but that's true. But he devised all kinds of uh, sales aids and gimmicks and plates and dishes and toys and all, all kinds of things to promote Moxie. One of the things, first things he did was take the Moxie nerve food in plain block letters and just called it Moxie and came out with this logo, which we call the Foxtail logo. And uh, that was used for two or three years. And we liked it so much that we used it as the basis for the logo for our club, New England Moxie Congress. In 1907, they devised the logo as we see it today with the swinging crossbar and the X and some variation of that logo has been in, enforced ever since 1907. Okay, one of the things that he wanted to do was have somebody that he could identify with a brand, some personality or some image that people would always relate to when they make them think of, of the drink. He came out with the Moxie Kid. He's kind of a cute, cute guy. Uh, he also invented the first Moxie six pack, which was a bag. I say, so you you go to the store and you get a bag of six Moxies. But that didn't last long. Uh, the Moxie logo was used on the Stanley Steamers, which were the vehicles of, in the time back in the early 1900s. And one of the drivers for one of these Stanley Steamers was a kind of a cute little kid with a nice smile. And they said, well, maybe, maybe we can make him the Moxie boy. So they did. They used his image on advertising back around between 1905 and 1907, eight, something like that, just before they changed the logo. But then they said, no, we need something that's more forceful. So the sex symbol of the era was Rudolph Valentino. Uh, if anybody 
and your grandparents remember uh, this is a guy that would uh, shepherd young ladies into the, their, their tent and say uh, something. <laughs> <laughs> but he had dark eyes and he had a piercing smile and he, he drove all the ladies wild. They said, we got to have something that looks like that. So they came up with the Moxie Boy, which is still used today. He has dark eyes and a piercing gauge and a finger that's pointing at you saying, drink Moxie. <laughs> well, that lasted up through the 40s. They, people got kind of sick of this guy kind of staring at them. So they said, we got to soften this guy up a little bit. And the sex symbol of the time in the 40s was old blue eyes. So they softened up the image of the Moxie Boy. Yeah, yeah. And they gave him blue eyes and a little more casual look and more friendly and, and so forth. But same basic pose. And then, as I said, Deb Williams represented Moxie for a number of years. So they used his image with kind of a pointing finger there. And over the years, they continued to use the Moxie boy, kind of muted, kind of stylized on the labels. Now, when Coca-Cola of Northern New England took them over, they said, well, you know, we, we got to appeal to a wider audience. And maybe this Moxie boy, he's, he's kind of old, so let's do something different. And they came out with a Moxie swirl. But guess what? Went over like a concrete cloud. <laughs> <laughs> Bring back the boy. <laughs> they listened, and they did. They had an advertising agency here in town that did a wonderful job. They recreated the original Moxie boy and his image is now on the cans and bottles of Moxie, much to Moxie lovers' uh, liking. Another marketing uh, ploy that Moxie used was the invention of the Moxie horse mobile. Now the horse mobile, uh, back in dentists use a tooth, and eyeglass makers use eyeglasses to just show people what they had. So early, Moxie had Moxie bottle wagons that used to go around and dispense Moxie from, from the back of horse-drawn wagons. So that was kind of limited in appeal. The and then in 1919, they invented the Moxie horse mobile. This was a replica of a horse mounted on a car and with all the running gear, the steering wheel and the brakes and all that up where a guy could actually drive this thing sitting on the horse. And if you can imagine a whole fleet of these going around the country, they attracted a little bit of attention. They used it in advertising. This is one from uh, probably the 30s or something like that. And even today, there's only one original, but there's several replicas that still exist. The original is up in Clark's Trading Post in Lincoln. If you ever go up there, you can see that original horse mobile. This one happens to be a replica, but we take it to, to parades and, and it still, still gets a lot of attention. And today the Moxie Company, or it used to be the Moxie Company, used the fleet of trailers uh, as, with the Moxie Boy and with a new logo saying, live your life with Moxie. And uh, it's still pretty attractive as you see these things going down the road. Now the bottle house, and here's a Manchester connect connection. In 1907, the Moxie Company built a 33-foot wooden refreshment stand. And it was meant to take, a, take different fairs and, uh, and venues to uh, dispense Moxie from, and it was a replica of the Moxie bottle at the time. Here's a 1907 at a food fair in Boston, and then it was at Coney Island for a while, in 1910, they took it to Pine Island Park in Manchester, New Hampshire. And there it stood, and his, uh, the, the park is in the lower left, to, that's Pine Island Pond, and to the right is the airport property. And here's kind of a look of uh, what Pine Island Park, and how it was laid out. If anybody's familiar with it, there's an island on which the roller skating rink was, and that's to the left bridge that goes across to that island and we think that that moxie bottle stand was just to the right of that bridge um, up, up to the upper upper left if you can see it this is the 
roller skating rink, and that's the bridge that goes over to the island. And here's a view from my back porch. I look across Pine Island Pond, and I see that bridge. And to the left of that bridge was where the Moxie Bottle Stand used to be between 1910 and 1920. This is what it looked like when it was, was in Pine Island Park. It's Clyde following the ladies with a free sample of Moxie. No, I guess he paid for them. I don't know. <laughs> there are very few pictures of uh, Pine Island or the Moxie Bottle House while it was in the, in the park. Is uh, Matilda and Jethro, and that's from their finest in a 110 degree summer day. <laughs> Obviously you need some cold moxie in that condition. And 1920, the moxie company sort of abandoned that stand and decided that horse mobiles were a better thing to invest their money into. So in 1920, they abandoned it. We don't know whether they sold it or whether they gave it away, but bought this, uh, the pieces of the bottle house, they brought, brought it across a the lake, frozen lake <coughs> of Pine Island Pond, and put it on a building lot. And then they proceeded to build a cottage attached to it. So here's the bottle, you can just see the cottage uh, attached to it. And this is uh, the people that did buy it, and they get a little press at the time. Again, you can see the cottage to the right attached to the bottle. Subsequently, they put uh, shingles on it. And here's what it looked like in roughly 1922, the cottage and uh, shingled over with uh, cedar shingles. And later on, they put an addition onto the cottage and they actually covered the bottle with uh, asphalt shingles. They had two layers of, of insulation, if you will. But it was primarily used as a summer cottage. The people that owned it were the Todds from uh, New York. He, he was a newspaper guy, and they used to come up during the summers uh, as a summer cottage. But he, they would involve all the neighbors uh, in annual corn roasts. So the corn roasts were a feature of the neighborhood for, for years. And here's some of the neighbors. One of the people in this picture just happens to be in this audience right now. <laughs> Esther, where are you? <laughs> now, I don't know what these people were doing, but I have a suspicion they were drinking something other than Moxie. <laughs> <laughs> this is the bottle house as it uh, existed just before people abandoned it. The Todd family kind of drifted off. And uh, it was kind of in disrepair for quite a while. And this fellow, you might know him, he wrote a book called In the City, and one of the chapters in that book was It Takes Moxie. And it was talking about the bottle house and the fact that no one wanted to buy it and what's gonna happen to it. And it was pretty good publicity for somebody that may have had a hankering to buy a cottage with a bottle sticking out of it. They, they're few and far between. Somebody did. 1999, an antique dealer in Maine bought the, the house, bought the bottle, and they started taking it apart. And you see the two layers of cedar shingles over with uh, asphalt shingle, shingles over them. And they, again, started taking this thing apart. Inside the house, there were two levels. They had bedrooms, and they had kind of a, a staircase going up to the second floor and up to the third floor. And here's from the third floor bedroom what, what they saw into the neck of the bottle. So they went ahead and they started taking this thing apart. <clears throat> and guess what? Underneath all these shingles is a label. And exposed that moxie label that hadn't been seen by human beings for 80 years. Now unfortunately they had a bedroom in there and they cut out a, a window for the bedroom right in the middle of that label. But that's the way it was. Is it what it was back in 1910? So, taking it apart, and it was meant to come apart in pieces because it was meant to take take from different venues, fairs and, and uh, carnivals and whatever. So this is the top of that uh, 
of that bottle. On the very top was a simulated bottle cap, four feet in diameter, bright silver. I want you to fix that in your mind, it's very important. So down it came and they took the pieces apart, numbered them fortunately, and as it came apart, you can see there was a 19 foot sections by three feet and each one of them were pinned together and they took them apart and eventually put them in a U-Haul trailer and off they went. And this is what was left of the camp, the cottage, after the bottle part was removed. And if you look right close inside that place where the bottle was, uh, was the bathroom. So the bathroom was right next to the, uh, uh, where the bottle was. You'd have to go through it to get to the bedrooms in the, in the bottle. Today, in, on that lot, they demolished the camp and they just built a standard uh, family house. And that's, again, a half a block away from where I live today. So all those pieces were taken up to Maine. A guy donated his garage as a holding area for them and they engaged people to uh, preserve the thing, because obviously it was an 80, 90 year old building and it was made out of wood, so they needed some kind of preservation and a lot of care was taken to get the right kind of epoxy coating and, and do that. And in the process, we wanted to preserve as much of the label as we could and you see the difference in color, that's where the roof of the cottage met the bottle, and it was sealed with tar. So you can imagine what it took to get all that tar off without destroying the label underneath. So that was pretty well documented at the time. And that took about 10 years to, to store this thing, because no one really knew what to do with it. But the Matthews Museum in Union, Maine, if you remember, Union was the birthplace of Dr. Thompson who invented Moxie. Uh, they said, well, you, we can use it in our museum, but you got a 33 foot bottle here. It's not gonna fit in our museum. They said, okay, we'll build an addition. So in 2009, uh, with volunteer labor, a building was built to attach to the Matthews Museum, which interiorly was 40 feet high, so it could handle this bottle. The base was made for it and all the pieces were taken from the guy's uh, garage, assembled, and then with again volunteer labor, they put the whole thing together again and uh, let's see, yeah, that, that was one of the final pieces of the top of the bottle going on and you see that that hole in the label was still there. But just to show what it would have been like had there not been a window there, he fabricated a insert and put the same lettering that was on there 100 years ago and the same coloring that would have been on that label at that time. So, so this is on exhibit at the Matthews Museum in Union, Maine, which is open from uh, July and August. And the scenario Clyde that's uh, dispensing the moxie is still in the front door and the signs are uh, the way it was in 1910. Again, that's showing the 1910 version. So we invite anyone that's up in that area to certainly stop by if you're interested in moxie at all and see the moxie bottle house that used to be here in Manchester, New Hampshire uh, and a lot of other moxie uh, memorabilia and so forth. Uh, some famous people uh, either like Moxie or their name was used to support it. And one of them was Teddy Roosevelt, who was, you know, pit, uh, rough and ready Teddy and, and uh, led the strenuous life. So Moxie says, well, this is the basis of a strenuous life, this Moxie nerve food. <laughs> Calvin Coolidge, when he was. Uh, when he was inaugurated in uh, Vermont, uh, he had a, it's another story, it's in the book, but basically he 
had a round of moxie delivered to all the people that uh, were engaged in his inauguration. And then Senator Snow from Maine introduced uh, the Kennebunkport resident to moxie. And a lot of people followed suit. They said, you know, this moxie thing must be something. We, we, we better tag on to that. <laughs> Okay, now the meat of the story. How Moxie won World War II. Essentially, it's three phases. Uh, just before World War II, uh, drinking Moxie was fun and games. It was an enjoyable soft drink, hot summer day. She's got a lot of Moxie, he's got a lot of Moxie. Uh, that's the way things went. But when World War II started, uh, things changed a little bit. And uh, a saying came out is still used today, what this country needs is plenty of moxie. And that was a saying that moxie came out with, and we, we think it's apropos even today. Uh, the workers that made tanks and planes and so forth, they worked hard, uh, they needed some pep and energy, so moxie was promoted for them. And of course, service people, uh, we would like to say that they had a lot of nerve, and so a little nerve food obviously is gonna help. Uh, toward the middle of the war years, it looked like America was gonna go uh, win this thing. So it promoted Moxie and uh, they were still collecting metal for tanks and so forth. So Moxie says, well, buy the big bottle of Moxie because there's only one metal cap instead of the five small bottles of moxie, <laughs> save for the war effort. And then they started preparing uh, toward the end of the war for peace. And uh, this is just to show you that how patriotic moxie was trying to pr promote itself. And even today with the peace greeters, we still think that our troops have a lot of moxie and promote that. So, Another thing was Uncle Sam and his design back in, I don't know, I guess it was actually World War I. And uh, he had an intense gaze and a pointing finger. But guess who he was modeled after? <laughs> That's right. Okay, now, the real story how Moxie won World War II. Rainier Air Force Base was what the airport was back in the war years it was taken over by the military, and one of its primary missions was to teach a lot of flyers how to accurately bomb by sending bombers out to New Boston, Joe English Hill, and they used the Norton bomb site, which was a new innovation back at the time. So to train all these bombers on the Norton bomb site was a big mission at, at Grenier. Now, I want you to memorize all this. <laughs> it was highly technical and, and top secret at the time. People using it didn't even know what it was in a lot of cases. Now, back to the Moxie Bottle House. As you saw in some of the previous maps, uh, the Bottle House was located right across Pine Island Pond from from Grenier, so it was very close. Okay, now remember this, four foot bright silver cap, okay? So all the bombers would take off on runway 31 going west, and they had to pass by, see that X, that's the Moxie, Moxie Bottle House. So on their way out, they saw that and remembered that as a landmark. He's looking at it from the other side, coming back, runway 13, Pine Island Pond is, is seen there, okay? It was dusk, bombers had, had they spent the whole day bombing Joe English Hill, and they were looking for a landmark to figure out how to land on route on runway 13. Well, that uh, orange dot is where the Moxie Bottle House used to be. So guess what? All these bombers that uh, had just successfully uh, used the Norton bomb site to practice bombing out in New Boston, 
came back and they looked for this four foot silver landmark. And that let them successfully land back at Grenier. So successful and safely and full of knowledge of how to take care of the Germans. Then they were shipped over to uh, Europe and they bombed the living bejesus out of the Germans and won the war. Okay, so now, after the war, all is fun and games, and they went back to drinking Moxie. And that is how Moxie helped win World War II. That's all, folks. <laughs> Please feel free to buy uh, some Moxie memorabilia. We get hats, t-shirts, bumper stickers, and of course, Dennis and I will be happy to uh, sign books for anybody that would like to buy one. Thank you very much. Thank you.